can I have the clicker? Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Martin BZ. Um, yeah. So I'm going to talk about communication. See if the clicker works. There we go. Oh, go back. Ah, there we go. Uh, slash water on GitHub. All right, conversations. Um, humans have conversations, and generally, what they try to do is uh, like come to share some shared understanding. Um, and I'm going to talk about. Uh, not just human conversations, but um, how we can communicate these ideas. So with humans, uh, we have several different mediums, uh, like verbal, uh, which then breaks down into written and oral, um, and nonverbal, which is like body language, and uh, tele telepathy. Um, yeah. So uh, how do programs uh, conversate? Um, traditional programs, this is for like Linux and Unix, System 5. Um, we have signals, pipes, sockets, message queues, semaphores. There's a lot of different ways uh, two programs on a computer uh, can talk to each other. And it doesn't really matter if you don't understand what these are. I'm just putting out that there's a lot of different methods. And we'll talk a little bit. Uh, more about them later. So, uh, Ethereum contracts. Uh, Ethereum contracts are like the first uh, program on a blockchain, right? So, how do these programs communicate? Well, currently there's only really one method, um, and that is atomic synchronous calls. So, what is a synchronous call? Um, so, this graph shows. Uh, the lifeline of three programs. Program A is running, then it makes a call, uh, which sends, is like, program A is like saying something to program B, all right? Giving it some information. B receives it uh, and starts running. And when that happens, A freezes. Um, then B may make a call to C. Uh, and when it does that, B and A are frozen. Then C, and when it's done, is going to return some information to B. B might do something with the information, then it's going to return it to A. So that, that's what it means to be synchronous. Like uh, when one program talks to the other program, it freezes or uh, blocks. So uh, what does atomic mean? Well, means when uh, A, if it has some state, uh, something that changes, right? Maybe it stores something. That's what we refer to as A state. Uh, when A calls B, we have to keep around A state and B state. And then when B calls C, we have to keep around A, B, and C state. And then when C returns to B, we also have to keep around A, B, C state. And then finally, when B returns to A, we have to keep around A, B, C's in state. And then finally, when A is done running, we can either save the state, or if B crashes, or A crashes, then we throw all that away. So either everything works, or nothing works, right? It's the end result of atomic. So with blockchain computers, um, we have sort of this weird problem. Like when it comes, uh, it's a, for Ethereum contracts talking to other Ethereum contracts, so far this is you know worked out. But like, what happens if a blockchain? Uh, what happens to the blockchain running, and how does uh, a computer program communicate to each and local programs? So, for example, um, we might want our blockchain computer to talk to our local computer or vice versa. So um, doing that synchronously, anatomically, doesn't quite make sense here. Here's how like, computers and currently, local programs currently talk to the blockchain. You send in a transaction, um, the transaction gets included in the block, then you get a transaction receipt to your computer. 
And that's different from uh, an asynchronous or atomic uh, uh, communication. It's neither of those things. So uh, atomic synchronous calls run into some problems here when we want to communicate outside of the blockchain. Um, for one, they break down when we have high latency. So when a computer program talks to a program on a blockchain, there's going to be a lot of latency. It's going to take a while for the uh, computer program to get a response. And the reason that's a problem is because full atomicity is expensive. Um, imagine if our local program uh, had to keep all of its state around in memory until it got a response. Maybe it was even dependent on other states. Um, so holding that around uh, a lot of times is unnecessary. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. Yeah, and it's hard to interplay with existing systems because that's not the way most programs work today. So an alternative to uh, atomic and synchronous calls are synchronous calls. So remember before when A sent a message to B, A was stuck. It couldn't run, it had a block. But with synchronous computation, A can send a message to B and it's free to do something else now. It may get another message and start running again. B then can send a message to C and exit, also do more stuff, etc. Um, yep. So, to sort of build a taxonomy of uh, the different systems, um, synchronous communication happens with uh, Ethereum contracts and blocking interprocess communication. Um, asynchronous, um, like so, PC to blockchain or blockchain to PC, as always well asynchronous with uh, sending a transaction and getting a receipt. Um, Non-blocking interprocess communication. Most cross-shard communication schemes are asynchronous uh, and humans. Um, it'd be really funny, if, or it'd be slightly odd if uh, I was having a conversation and said something and then um, immediately after I said something, I just totally froze until the other party in the conversation responded. Um, yeah. Uh, and when it comes to atomicity, we sort of have the same dichotomy. Um, we have Ethereum contracts and DPs, databases that usually have some form of atomicity. Um, but most other co uh, communication styles are non-atomic, so PC to blockchain, cross shard, um, non-blocking IPC, um, and blocking IPC in humans. Um, So, asynchronous uh, non-atomic messaging is sort of like the lowest common denominator for everything here. Um, but it, it has some problems, right? So, um, sometimes we do need atomicity, right? So if we start off with this primitive of atomic, um, non-atomic asynchronous communication, um, one question is, can we build atomicity on top of it? Um, this is kind of known as the train in the hotel problem. And the idea is, if I'm trying to book a ticket with a hotel and book a ticket on a train at the same time, um, how do I do this in an asynchronous system? The other problem that gets uh, brought up often is it adds developer complexity. Because uh, there, it, it's harder for people to think about. So to address the train and hotel problem, oh, so these were supposed to be white lines here. There's actually black lines here. I don't know if you can see them. Anyways, um, the blue dot is uh, someone who is trying to order the um, plane and the, or sorry, <laughs> the train ticket and the hotel ticket at the same time. Uh, the Yellow dot in the top is the train contract, and the bottom one is the hotel contract. So, what's going to happen is um, the managing contract, transaction managing contract, is going to send a message both to the train and the hotel contract um, 
asking them uh, if they can get a ticket, right? And the train con contract, and if everything goes good, and the hotel contract will send back a, a response, yes. And they will reserve uh, the tickets for the, the uh, person. Um, then once the managing contract gets back those two responses, it will send another message to both of these contracts to commit. And this is uh, the basis of uh, what's called a two-phase commit. And there is many, many different formalizations of two-phase two commits, uh, and different ones are, uh, work different for your application. But um, the point here is it's solvable to build uh, atomic um, transactions out of non-atomic base components. And like another intuition to this is you can think that uh, really everything we build on is ultimately at the root level and distributed systems is TCP, which is uh, asynchronous and non-atomic, right? So we've already uh, learned how to turn something that was asynchronous and non-atomic into something that's synchronous and non-atomic or atomic. So the fact that we could replicate this, again, is not really surprising. <coughs> so the other problem is uh, developer complexity. Um, if you come from JavaScript, you might be familiar with uh, callback hell. So where you get lots of callbacks inside of callbacks inside of callbacks. Um, and I think this is mostly, well, for a large part, it can be solved by promises and primitives like async and await. So if you don't know what those things are, it's fine. Um, what this means, though, is it, uh, it's a high-level abstract. You, underneath, things are still happening asynchronously, but we provide a way to, so you can structure your logic so it still looks like it's happening synchronously, right? So you still can reason about things in the same way. Yeah, so it provides um, logical synchronicity. Um, so, I think the end result is that from the taxonomy sort of look, looks like this. Asynchronous non-atomic messages are the smallest base components of everything, right? They're the smallest unit that we have. It's a small primitive. Then from that, we can build atomic things, structures, and we also can provide logical uh, synchronous structures. So it looks logically like it's synchronous. Um, so yeah, for that reason, I think like asynchronous non-atomic messaging is uh, a better abstraction for how our programs should communicate. Um, so with synchronous messaging in Ethereum, it's like tightly coupled. Uh, we don't really don't have to think about how messages are handled because it's uh, just built in. Only one program can execute at a time. But now if we have asynchronous messaging, that means multiple programs can be executing uh, at any given time. And that means multiple programs can be sending uh, multiple messages to a single program. So we need a way to handle messages or a model. Um, and this can be thing, thought of in human terms too, like multiple people can be having conversations at the same time. Multiple people can be trying to have conversations with the same person at the same time. That doesn't really work out very well though. So, um, one model or one way to handle messages is called the actor model. And it's a very simple model. So. And I like it because you can think of it in physical terms. Um, so to describe what it is, uh, what actors have are a mailbox, some storage, and an address. Kind of like your house. Um, and what actors do, uh, they can create more actors, send messages to other actors, and designate what to do with the next message. And that's all the actor model is. You can sort of visualize it like this, right? Uh, I have an actor, and you can spawn other actors. 
Um, and actors can send queue messages on other actors' inboxes, um, et cetera. So uh, in the blockchain world, we have a few differences though. Uh, uh, things have to be deterministic. In pure actor model, things are non-deterministic. And one nice thing about the actor bug, or actor uh, model is, is uh, you automatically avoid weird situations like re-entry bugs. So um, with uh, um, synchronous calls, um, you get into a situation this where A calls B and B might call A and then now we have two instances of A running at the same time and they could be both mutilating the same state and that can uh, cause confusion in the program. So with the actor model, what would happen is A would call B and continue running to completion. Then if B called A again, um, what would happen is it would not start up a new instance of A, but it would just, that message would get processed after the first instance was done uh, running. So lastly, who can talk to who? Um, so we might have a program with two functions, and uh, main and foo. And uh, program A might have a reference to uh, program uh, B's uh, function. And a program here can only talk to a program if it has a reference to. This is the address in the actor model, if you will. Not only that, but like programs can share references to each other. So if A has a reference to C and to B, A can give the reference to C to B and now B can talk to C. And the reason we don't want to let everyone talk to everyone, uh, so in Ethereum, like everyone can talk to everyone, right? Um, so if you constrain it to like who has references to who, you can build uh, isolation, right? You can build contracts that are protected um, by um, who has the reference. So this authentication re contract has a reference to the logic and database contract, but no one else does. So we know that um, these, these contracts here, we don't have to worry about writing logic to protect them from any other malicious attacks or malicious messages, right? The only thing we have to worry about is the authentication contract. So we can focus our effort on, uh, you know, auditing that. That in isolation allows us to build more modular components because now I can build a logic component and hey, it's decoupled from security. So in literature, funk requests are known as capabilities. Uh, it's a capability to send a message. Uh, and it's opaque, it's unforgeable. That means the program can't see it. And it's transferable. Yep, so that's it, all right. Thank you, Martin. Okay, now.